I think, on what I regard as the, the perhaps most important topic of the day, because what happens in the emerging markets is going to play such a huge role in what sort of world uh, we're going to see emerge over the next 20, 30 years, but also um, what I think there's so much in play at the moment in terms of what kind of uh, philanthropic and philanthropreneurial models uh, get adopted, and there's a lot of experimentation going on. Um, as uh, Kate mentioned, I have um, wrote a book called Philanthro Capitalism a few years ago, uh, which has a chapter on philanthropreneurship in it. And one of the things that I've found in the last few years is that I've had a growing number of invitations to go and speak around the world in emerging markets to, to the newly successful entrepreneurs who are really trying to understand how can they play more of a role uh, in solving the big social challenges of their age. And they're particularly interested in understanding the American model of philanthropy and philanthropeneurship, but also trying to figure out how it adapts, uh, can be adapted to their local situation. And I think one of the questions we're going to explore in this session is you know, how, how do these American models trans or European models even originally translate across uh, to the emerging markets? Um, there's also been a, a sea change in aid and development policies over the last few years to focus much more away from pure government funding, grant making and so forth towards uh, market-based solutions. Um, and we want to hear a bit more about what the role of philanthropeneurship is in that new framework and how that's working out. And also, at the same time, a quite alarming, in my view, uh, growing movement in the emerging markets to crack down on foreign donations uh, crossing borders and supporting NGOs in the emerging world, which um, you know, is, is probably the most ret one of the more retrograde uh, things going on in globalization at the moment, and I think has, achieved, has seen far too little attention. We might want to touch on what impact that's been having as well. Uh, to do this, we've got a great panel, as I say. To my immediate left, we have uh, Strive Masiawa, who is founder and executive chairman of Econet, among many other uh, things, um, including being a trustee of the Rockefeller Foundation and, and, and more, which I'll bring up. Next to him is uh, Gargi Banerjee, who's the founding member of Pragya, which is a, a non-profit that works with um, all sorts of marginalized communities in India and, and Kenya in particular. Um, Mr. Shiv Kemka, who is chairman of the Global Education and Leadership Foundation, among many other things. Um, next to him is Professor Hashim Sarkis, who is dean at the School of Architecture and Planning at MIT. And at the very end, uh, Mr. Shashi Bulaswar, who is CEO of the Institute for Transformative Technologies, which he'll tell us a bit more about in a moment. To get us going, I wanted to get all of you engaged by answering three questions for our, from our polling technology. So if you'd all take your polling devices. Um, the first question is about the potential for uh, philanthropeneurship uh, in the emerging markets, and whether you as an audience think that it's going to be easier to be a philanthropeneur in the emerging markets, which is answer number one, easier because there's more flexibility possible, but also perhaps there's greater need and therefore greater willingness to take risks and so forth, which we heard about this morning. Secondly, it's harder because the issues of trust, accountability, and transparency are much more thorny and difficult to, in, to deal with uh, in the emerging markets. And three, no, not different at all. It's pretty much the same as in the developed world. So if you'd give your votes now, that would be great. Now oh, we've got a countdown clock and everything, so 10 seconds to go. So if you can press that one button in 15 seconds. Okay, so only about a third think it's easier over half think it's harder. So nice division of opinion. We'll see what the panel think about that. Second question. Uh, there's a lot of talk uh, around among philanthropeneurs that uh, leapfrogging, that they can drive leapfrogging uh, in emerging markets so that maybe in five or 10 years time, we're gonna have a fundamentally better uh, system of addressing the big challenges of facing society than maybe the legacy systems that the rich world are dealing with. Um, so the first answer number one is that essentially this idea of leapfrogging is a myth. Uh, secondly, yes, this is true. And three, 
Uh, maybe it's true, but it'll happen in a, a long time, uh, far in the future. So you've got 15 seconds starting from now. Okay, so only 23% think this is a myth. So there's a lot of faith that leapfrogging is either happening or going to happen. I'm quite surprised by that, actually, in some ways, but it's, we're going to hear more about that again in the panel. Third question and final question. So by, uh, the question here is about whether uh, new models are going to emerge of philanthropy and philanthropeneurship uh, in the emerging markets that will actually cause the existing philanthropic and philanthropeneurial establishment in the rich world to change their practices. And so um, just two choices here. One, uh, the philanthropic, globally philanthropic and entrepreneurial practices, one, will still strongly be inspired and based on models from the most developed countries, or two, they will have been transformed by the actors of today's emerging world. So vote now, 15 seconds. <laughs> The answer is, well, yeah, I guess most, the majority here think it will have been transformed by the practices of the emerging world. So we'll turn to the panel. Shiv, I'm going to start with you. Um, how do you see the current state of play today? Do you find those answers that you heard plausible in terms of the optimism about uh, philanthropy and philanthropeneurship and the, its ability to really be inventive and innovative in, in tackling problems in the emerging world? Uh, thanks, Matthew. So I think my answers to all of those was really all of the above, because the complexity in emerging markets is such, and the scale of the problems is such, that you're seeing uh, hidebound traditional resistance to change. At the same time, you're seeing a lot of innovation happening, uh, lots of pockets of innovation, and it's all one big jumble of activity right now. But what I think the game changer is, is actually uh, the digital revolution. And I think that can change things because information can reach everyone. And uh, India has a program called Digital uh, India, for example. And I think with programs like that, I think innovation and philanthropeneurial activity will be able to reach uh, really everyone. And I think that can be a huge uh, tsunami that allows things to change. And I actually believe that a lot of the solutions will be homegrown solutions and will actually come back and affect the rest of the world. Now, Bill Gates and the Giving Pledge have been over to India a couple of times trying to recruit Indian business people um, to be, I guess, American-style philanthropists. I mean, have you, and it doesn't seem that that's been hugely successful. Do you see the spread of that model and, and going into India in a more effective way? So I think that, uh, you know, Bill Gates was just in India last week and Sal Khan and there was a meeting with Indian philanthropists, other families who got together to talk about uh, the giving pledge and to talk about uh, innovation. And I think we're seeing a culture of innovation emerging in the family businesses, which is more, uh, more strategic than purely programmatic. Historically, families would give, but it would be to the hospital, to the local school, etc. And I think now you're starting to see the concept of strategic philanthropy and much more engagement by these family entrepreneurs in philanthropeneurship, in actually thinking about how can we resolve s problems at scale. And do you see that, though, being fundamentally still carried out within family business structures predominantly, as opposed to establishing separate foundations in, in the American way? So I think most of the big families have foundations set up, but now there's a new rule in India, the 2% CSR rule, which means that every business in India has to give 2% of its profits to uh, philanthropy every year by law. And so you're starting to see a lot of innovation happen with people thinking about uh, those who are ethical and altruistic thinking about how to put that money to good work and the others thinking about how to reuse that money for things that they're doing anyway. But uh, I think it's a good thing. That means it releases about three and a half billion dollars a year to focus on uh, philanthropy at scale. The problem is it's a little bit like tributaries of the river going into a desert 
And if it's lots of little trickles, it'll have little impact. And the question is, how do we create collaborative action at scale, where everyone focuses on a few initiatives to actually make a difference? Now, Gargi, we'll stick with India uh, for a bit. I mean, you're on the other side of the, the, the table. You're an NGO trying to raise money to deal with people very much at the margins of society. I mean, how do, how does, how do you see the current state of play in India initially? I mean, are you finding that risk-taking, long-termism approach that we heard talked about this morning? Use the microphone, please. Yeah. Shoots currently. I wouldn't say that it's developing definitely, but it's uh, predominantly at a green shoot stage. I think there are three um, currents of change in uh, philanthropy in India. One is the diffusion of development, which means that uh, essentially what was the preserve or the exclusive preserve of governments is now moving to uh, include other players as well. In fact, the government itself is wooing both industry and uh, media, I mean, industry in particular to to um, improve its public services and its infrastructure, and also media to try and bring about some social transformation. So that kind of diffusion of development is happening. Um, the second, I would say, is definitely there are quite a few uh, attempts at innovating in public services in particular. Uh, one, to bridge the gaps in public services, and the second is to reform existing services. And in this, uh, there is some support from donors who are more enlightened and who are more concerned and who have that long-term vision. Uh, for instance, in uh, Pragya itself, we have innovated to create agri-advisors who are um, village youth who have been trained to provide extension services, agricultural extension services, which is a gap in several areas in India. And uh, these are you know, helping farmers, small farmers, to adapt to climate change in their area. So that's, for instance, a bridging of um, services, public services. And the other innovation I would like to uh, you know, um, recount out here is an innovation which is helping to reform the education system, particularly in marginalized areas, where uh, what you have is essentially sink schools or child-minding centers rather than deliverers of quality education. So Pragya has innovated to bring out an education information management system, which sort of involves the local school management committees to um, assess teacher instruction quality and school operations alongside uh, student learning levels and thereby provide the feedback both to the schools itself and to the governments on how to improve the school operations and provide um, better quality education. So that's, I would say, the second thing that I think is happening. And the third, of course, is uh, a lot of partnerships and a lot of collaborations. And once again, there's quite a bit of um, you know, involvement of donors and how they, how they perceive working together would aid, um, I would say, multiplier impacts in a sense. So for instance, we have this uh, livelihood program, which is an innovative livelihood program for uh, small farmers in the Himalayan belt, which uh, promotes the cultivation of medicinal plants which are native to that region. Uh, so we have had um, grant funding from you know, the typical traditional grant-making bodies like European Commission, a philanthropreneur like uh, Whitley Fund for Nature. We have had uh, research institutions involved in it, such as the Indian Agricultural Research Institute and Forest Research Institute, who have developed the cultivation protocols for the medicinal plants. We have had, the, on the market side, we have had Dabur, which is a herbal products major, which has uh, signed up buyback arrangements with the farmers. Uh, Nabad, which is an apex uh, bank in India, which has provided credit to farmer cooperatives. We have had, even at the international marketing end, um, Simon Mills, who's a renowned expert in medicinal plants based in the UK, who's looked at the international marketing strategy for these medicinal plants. So that's the kind of an you know, all-round kind of partnership arrangement, which is also evolving okay, so, in these areas. So two Thank questions you. I want to ask you as well. I mean, one is, um, you know, we mentioned this two, uh, Shiv mentioned the 2% uh, CSR responsibility. Are you seeing companies respond to Do that in a sensible way, or are they largely just <laughs> re, you know, repurposing at, at it for existing activities? At this stage, Matthew, it's uh, very, very early. So there are companies... We, we say that some do out of compassion and others out of compulsion. So that's the kind of stage that they are at. Many are still evading. 
but there are those who were into such giving. I think they are looking at more strategic giving now rather than the usual uh, charity kind of giving. Okay, and the third question, India is one of those countries that's long had a very hostile approach to foreign uh, money coming into NGOs, but has, under the current government, been much more aggressive in that respect. Are you, how, how big a problem is that, and are you seeing local donors uh, stepping up to fill in the gap that international funders have left? Um, there are different kinds of, in fact, I, I wanted to bring that out as an, as an area which does require support as well. You know, we have um, donors looking at the needs that need to be uh, provided for the services that are the essential services for communities that are now missing them. And we also need to look at social equity, justice, inclusion, uh, marginalized groups, marginalized areas. Now, the latter still tends to get neglected, and some hidden in the latter are some politically contentious issues, which do have little support, because that would tend to, um, you know, that tends to uh, need a, a bit of a confrontation with the government, so that's where the, um, the issue comes. Okay. But however, I would say that the governments are, even in India, there's a clarion call for servicing the needs, for such as toilet building or skill building. So these are things where there is a clarion call for. And I think if these are really done well, they would empower these marginalized groups and thereby enable them to actually reach out and um, you know, achieve a greater equity and inclusion as well. All right, Strive, I wanted to turn to you. Um, firstly, talk about your, how you see the philanthropy world and, and to pick up on this question of you know, a, a few Africans have now signed the Giving Pledge, for example. Are you, do you expect um, and are you seeing the emergence of new models of philanthropy uh, in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa in particular? Do you see it being significantly like the American approach or is there something different? Well, well thank you. First of all, thank you for inviting me to this gathering. I am a member of the Giving Pledge, have been for a couple of years. Um, so I, have a, I also have an opportunity to look at the American uh, model for philanthropy as a member of the Board of Trustees of the Rockefeller Foundation, which probably represents best practice for the American model. And it's an extraordinary model. And it's underpinned by both value systems as well as the way America itself has developed. Um, the rest of the world hasn't had too many opportunities of producing uh, entrepreneurs with the kind of wealth of Bill Gates or, or, or uh, David Rockefeller, uh, the Rockefellers. So, it's always, it's never an easy thing to say, this is the best model. You know, speaking from the African perspective, uh, it, most people don't think of Africans as being philanthropists. But of the truth is, uh, small African business people, as small as they are, do give an extraordinary amount of what they produce because we don't have the natural underpinnings of the institutional underpinnings to support, um, uh, to create welfare. Uh, so what is changing is, of course, we are increasingly seeing more people creating wealth who are creating sufficient wealth to look beyond their families, local communities, and to create institutional frameworks for philanthropy. So in that sense, uh, that is a new uh, development. And do you see it, um, I mean, there was the, in one of the questions we talked about the, the sort of the trust and accountability issues and, and so forth. I mean, there's obviously, I mean, going back to Andrew Carnegie in America, there was a long discussion about how do you create the right social contract to make, you know, it possible for wealthy people to give back and, um, you know, and show that they're a positive force in society. I mean, how, how in Africa do you think that conversation is, is evolving? It, it's, it's early days. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, in countries like South Africa, for instance, it's, you know, it's, it's a conversation that is a very mature conversation, and they have, you know, the Oppenheimers and others who have made money over the last hundred years have long this, you know, the Rhodes Scholarship is still around, and that was money made in Africa. So, um, but it's a, it's a very early conversation. Uh, certainly there is no African government at the moment that feels compelled to be having that conversation because there just aren't that many people with private wealth of sufficient scale. Now, this notion of philanthropeneurship, I mean, there, at the heart of it, I think there is this sense that um, philanthropists can harness the, the power of entrepreneurship, but perhaps also the power of the, the profit motive to achieve change at a far more substantial scale than maybe traditional grant making uh, has been able to achieve. And often I hear the example cited as, as the mobile phone is the kind of killer app in this area that as, as the cell phone, and particularly the smartphone, starts to really spread around the emerging markets that almost of itself that's going to be the best thing going on in, the store, in, in development. But you know, more broadly there's an opportunity here for philanthropy to work uh, harnessing those profit making phones and I just wondered as you're, you're a leader in that industry how do you see the that that story unfolding and what's the proper balance or role that philanthropy plays compared with the the business just growing on its own it's it's not an easy question look at the end of the day um, these are just technologies you you have radio you have television you have mobile phones today People can use them for good, they can use them for evil. So, uh, we have the internet. So it's, it's, philanthropy is about not so much the technology and the delivery platforms, it's about the hearts and values of people who want to go out and use their resources to bring about change in the societies in which they live. So you're gonna have wealthy people who aren't willing to do anything beyond pay their taxes and feel quite justified that it's the role of the state. So, and I will never have a debate with somebody about what they do with their money. So, to, to the extent that these platforms are now available, like mobile money, we have tools for greater inclusion of people. But it's going to be about what people really feel they want to do to help others. Now, Shashi, I mean, your whole uh, institute of, of technology transfer is all around how do we get technologies out uh, into the developed world where they can, and how do we, how do we allow them to, uh, in, in the developing wor world, really achieve large-scale impact? So tell us, I mean, respond to what uh, Striver said, but maybe set out your own vision of, of the opportunity uh, and what you're seeing at the moment. Uh. The way we think of what we do is, is uh, we call it the Viagra problem. We call it the Viagra problem because um, if you compare, if you think of TB, tuberculosis, the best acting drug right now still takes six or seven months for basic TB. Right? And not enough money has gone into the R&D to solve that problem. On the other hand, a lot of money has gone into solving the Viagra problem. And so the question is, if you extrapolate from that one example, electrification, sanitation, water, and so on and so forth. Now, some of these problems are so big that they require big science. There isn't enough R&D money to solve these problems. And so the way we tend to think about it is, is, are, is there research sitting in the R&D institutions around the world that whether or not the original work was intended to solve these problems, can we cherry pick these things and then build out technologies? Now, what happens after we build out these technologies? You know, this, this, this oft-used phrase, uh, the fortune at the base of the pyramid, truth be told, companies in countries like India are already exploiting that market, but when you think of solutions like this, these companies don't have access to that R&D. And what we believe is that bridging that gap is extraordinarily important, which is, number one, as I said, cherry-picking uh, the, the IP and the patents, Number two is converting them into products and technologies that can have a commercial life. 
And number three is making it attractive to these companies to take them to scale. Because as exciting as the idea of being a social entrepreneur is in a country like India, the idea of a startup taking anything to scale for hardware is very, very complicated. And so, so finding that combination of, of uh, companies that can really take these solutions to scale is critical to solving these problems. And just uh, give us a couple of examples of where you've actually been able to make some progress. Um, where we are making progress, it's still early stage. I'll give you one example of something we're working on, which is uh, in sanitation. There's a, a British biochemist who figured out a very clever way of, of uh, breeding and using worms to compost human waste. Um, traditionally, if you think of the, the toilets problem, the sanitation problem, it has not really been solved without access to a sewer infrastructure. And by the time anything of that sort gets built out in these countries, it'll be a very, very long time. So imagine the power of an isolated island toilet where these worms are getting rid of the waste. Um, so we've figured out a way working uh, with a few partners to breed the worms and to build the toilets in a way so that within 24 hours the waste is gone. So there's no contamination, no smell, and these things can actually be built quite inexpensively. Now in India, and as, as Shiv was saying, there's a very interesting uh, initiative of the government. It's called the Swachh Bharat, and there's a 12,000 rupee subsidy for every toilet that a household builds. Now we believe we can actually make these toilets for under that, under that subsidy. So what this now presents is a very attractive, scalable model that a large infrastructure company can, can, can say, we will build these toilets and can take them to scale across the country. So the bottom of the toilet at the bottom of the pyramid, I guess, in the, in the uh, business. He said it, not me. <laughs> um, actually, I left you to last because, I, I mean, you're, you're someone who is an architect and a, and a systems thinker, design thinker. Um, and you've done work both in the developed world and, and in the emerging markets. So I wanted to get your, your sense from what you've heard. Uh, you know, does, that, does, does that accord with your experiences? And, and, and how, do you, how do you see the differences between you know, philanthropeship in the developing world and the, and the developed world at the moment? From the point of view of an architect who has worked with different NGOs in different countries, Lebanon, Syria, and Kenya, I can speak more as the person observing how the client or this new form of client operates. Increasingly, they are seeking designers to help them give a value, dignity, form to problems that disempowered groups have and to enable them by design. That's a new phenomenon. And as an architect, I enjoy it a lot because I do enjoy working with them from the beginning, building trust. They come to you much earlier than regular clients. You develop this trust in the long term, you help select site, define the program, and then you become a fundraiser of sorts because your design has to be of a certain attractiveness to potential donors, to potential philanthropists. There are certain headaches associated with that because the uh, logic of raising funds for a project are different than the schedule and logic of raising funds for construction. And invariably, the NGOs change their mind about what they want to build because they are sh uh, shifted left and right by the potential philanthropists and donors. But in general, I feel that the role of design in philanthropy is very important and is somehow overlooked because most of the focus is on policy. But I would say that design itself is a form of bringing philanthropy and entrepreneurship together. It's philanthropic because it adds certain human values, we heard about that earlier this morning, to products, to mundane products, to mundane environments. It helps interface human beings with their environments in a more dignified way. And it's entrepreneurial because it is very project-oriented, it is innovative, and it adds a much needed ingredient, which is the imagination. Now, in terms of the connection between the kinds of projects I work on in the developing world and the developed world, uh, I would say that the field is leveling, that the network is no longer centered around models coming from the Western world and projected out, but that there is what is going on is more of learning from the margins. Uh, this is a term that the CoLab at MIT 
uses, where it does really look at problem areas, not in order to go help, but in order to identify how solutions come out from these places. And if we look at, for example, the problem of favelas, favelas are learning from each other how to come up with solutions. They are no longer relying on models coming from UNDP or from the World Bank to do so. But it sort of strikes me, and this, this moves us on to the next set of questions for the panel. I mean, uh, the big, one of the big crucibles uh, which is going to term, determine how the world looks in 10 or 20 years' time is the, is the mega cities that, that are emerging all around the, the emerging markets. And, you know, in some cases, China, perhaps, you're seeing some degree of planning uh, going in place to, 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 that will manage that process. But, you know, say the Indian cities or some of the other, you know, Indonesia or somewhere like that. I mean, it seems chaotic, um, really a huge challenge to um, shape the appropriate policies. You mentioned favelas and so forth. I mean, how do you, what role is there for philanthropeneurship to actually influence that? And I think back also to, to say the developed world where I think probably a whole bunch of our cities uh, were modernized just before democracy really took hold so that they could do big slum clearances and put in infrastructure which is going to be very hard to do in a place like Mumbai or whatever. I mean, how, how, so what lessons are you, are you seeing for philanthropeneurs? Again, if, if we look at best practices in this, uh, in this respect, I would say that Philanthropy is moving from reacting to acting. Initially, the reaction was, okay, let's help people identify, realize that they have stakes in the built environment and that they have rights to the built environment, even if they are squatters. Uh, empowering them, advocating their cases in front of authorities that are coming to clear the slums. Uh, and today, they're playing much more of a role of acting, designing solutions, introducing a new or alternative infrastructures like... So where have you seen that done well? Uh, Colombia, Brazil, Venezuela. Mm -hmm. And these models are so inspiring that they are now being copied in other places around the world. Mm -hmm. Shiv, I wanted to, to, to ask you also about this challenge of large scale because we've heard a lot of examples and I think a lot of them are still quite small scale and experimental. But you were saying to me over lunch that two million children a day, a day or a week, Two million children a month. A month. So two million children a month are being added to the Indian uh, education system. Um, and the system is widely regarded as failing many of the participants in it. I mean, how, how do you improve, achieve a large scale change in that system? I think, Matthew, your question goes to the core of the problem. So if we look at the world over the next 30 years, the various disagreements by economists and demographers, but let's say we add between two and three billion people in the next 30 years by 2050. Uh, a country like India, if we just look at the demographics, half the population, 650 million people below the age of 25. We need to create a million jobs a month for the next 30 years. We add two million children a month to our education system. Uh, the education system is failing. Just in a state like Uttar Pradesh, we lack 1.8 million teachers, 50% absenteeism in teacher attendance at schools, 70% uh, principal absence at schools in India. So that's just one example of the scale of the problem. We're talking about urbanization. 700 million people are going to move from rural to urban uh, settings in the next 30 years. 100 new smart cities are planned to be built. So the scale of the problem is enormous. And the question is, how do we solve these problems at scale? And uh, I think, actually, there's a lot of innovation happening all over the planet. And I think, actually, we know the solutions. The question is joint up collaborative action between government, private sector, NGOs, foundations, philanthropeneurships. To me, philanthropeneurship is about entrepreneurship with compassion, entrepreneurship with ethics and altruism. And the minute you do that, you can actually solve these problems because a lot of the problems about execution with ethics and altruism. And so our foundation's mission is to, we have a curriculum for schools. We started it 10 years ago. We now reach two and a half million children, principally in India, but in 14 countries. And the curriculum focuses on leadership with ethics and altruism, teaching young children that their objective is to be, in a way, a philanthropist. And how, be, I mean, but how, but how 
why is it so difficult to get this collaboration? And what can we do about that? I think it's about leadership and ethics. So Malcolm earlier this morning talked about that. Saib uh, Agnes said the same thing. Where are the values? Our education systems focus on math, science, literacy, but the values have been thrown out. There's very little focus on actually building the values of citizenship, global citizenship, ethics, altruism as a core part of a process where you select leaders that are ethical, altruistic, and you build yourself and aspire to be an ethical, altruistic leader. So Strive, I wanted to ask you, I mean, you were involved in at least two sort of major large-scale initiatives in Africa, one being the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, another being the private sector response to the Ebola crisis. Um, what, 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 what have you learned from that about the challenges of scale and how you know, an entrepreneurial person like you can play a role in um, getting that large-scale collaboration that may be necessary? Uh, uh, thank you. You know, I was just listening to my colleague there. If he meant, if he took India out and put Africa, it's the same issues. <laughs> it's, it's about demographics. You know, turn of the century, 80% of the world's population will be, in, will be in Asia and Africa. Half of the world's population will be African. Uh, three countries will be over a billion population, India, China, and Nigeria. So we are confronted with the same demographic issues around development. I think one of the great challenges, of course, is time. We don't have the time. And there are many disruptors coming through, including the issues of instability. Uh, caused by groups like Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, and so forth, which in many ways has underpinnings in our, ability to res in our inability to respond to creating opportunities for young people. And one of the low-hanging fruits, certainly from an African perspective, is agriculture. 63% of the world's Unutilized agricultural land is on the African continent. Again, we look at those demographics. 60% um, of our population is under the age of 25. So how do we quickly create jobs? Uh, if we, you can look at that from a security narrative too. If we don't address it, we have a challenge. So what are you learning about what you can do and how to get these alliances to work? We. Collaboration is key, but we have to do it from a global perspective. Um, addressing African agriculture and getting young people jobs in Africa is not an African problem, it's a global problem. We all have to address it. We all have to, and, the, and it's not even a government problem. So as entrepreneurs, we're becoming more conscious of the need to respond to these and you mentioned the issue of Ebola, there will always be shocks of that nature. And we have to ensure that people are much more, the poor are much more resilient to shocks, whether well, it be climate. I'm interested, I mean, in that particular case, I mean, was there a willingness on the behalf of governments to work with the private sector? Because it's quite a novel, it's quite a novel response. It was, it was a very novel response. Uh, I was asked to, to chair a, a group of, of Africa's leading uh, business people who funded essentially the African response to Ebola. So we sent in over 800 healthcare workers, which was the largest deployed contingent in the three countries. It was funded by the African private sector throughout. So the governments provided the people, the private sector came in, uh, we used mobile phone technology to bring in 150 million ordinary people to make micro donations, which had never been done in the history of the continent. And as you know, Ebola is now almost behind us. So uh, I want to bring in any of the other panelists who want to talk about this issue of scale before we go to questions from the audience. Well, uh, Picking up on this point Strive made about agriculture, um, here is one fundamental challenge. This is why I keep coming back to this question of science. Uh, virtually 100% of 
um, agriculture outside of sub-Saharan Africa and other developing countries relies on irrigation and fertilizer as a fundamental uh, set of inputs. Now, a little known fact is that virtually 100% of fertilizer around the world is made using one chemical process called the Haber-Bosch process. Right? And both Haber and Bosch are, are uh, uh, German uh, chemists who won the Nobel Prize a few decades back. And the problem is this, to build a factory that makes fertilizer using this process costs well over $100 million. And so as a result of that, by the time fertilizer is produced and shipped to the African continent, by the time it reaches the port city, it already costs 50% more than it costs a typical middle-class farmer in a country like the United States. So how do you solve agricultural development without really looking at a fundamental shift in production facilities like this? Kagi? Um, it is important to look at local level production, local level services, because I think scaling, uh, it's, it's one thing to look at scaling from the areas, from the point of view of areas which are already reasonably well serviced. But if you're looking at scaling at such that the areas in the shadows also get services, then one has to look at deployment of production capacities, deployment of production centers, to these local areas as well. Only then are you going to beat what uh, Shashi just talked about, which is also transportation issues but and the I, cost add-up. If I was up. to push you, I mean, you know, what would be the single most effective way of getting that shift to happen at, at a, a sufficient scale to move the needle and start to make it possible for so many of these jobs to, to be created in, in places like Africa and rural India and so forth that seem to be at the moment you know, not happening? Uh, one big thing is that we're looking at really, uh, I mean, I, I get back to the same point, which is we are still looking at having areas where, um, you know, areas of industrialization, of production, and areas which provide, which have the manpower. So if we actually try to push these production areas and centers to areas which do have the human resources, unemployed so needs resources. To be a policy decision there to will have to be that. Otherwise, you're looking at more and more people coming into the same cities, crowding the cities, urban slums, etc., which would be there. And whereas production capacities are not built in the areas uh, which are neglected, which are traditionally neglected, and therefore they continue. And in fact, that creates the disparities that are like fault lines in these emer emerging economies as well they actually threaten the sustainability of these economies. And I just, I mean, Hashim, you mentioned this, you know, we just heard about the need for policy, but I mean, you talked about design rather than policy. And I mean, how far can just better design pushed by the private sector, whether it be business or philanthropy, I mean, how far can that take us without significant policy change? They have to go hand in hand. There's no question there. It's just that design, leaps forward ahead in proposing alternatives, and then these translate back to policy, and the reverse can happen. The scale of the problems of urbanization are such that they require a very different mind frame today. I think NGOs have re been reluctant in entering into that problem because building and infrastructure are considered non-productive sectors. I think we need to change the mindset because they are part of the productive sector. Okay, let's take some questions from the audience. If we could have the lights up so I can see. There's a hand I can see in the middle there. Um, gentleman in the middle, the mic will come to you. I've heard a lot of problem statements uh, in the last 45 minutes. There's, well, there's a massive population issue in India of unemployment in Africa. And the intent I thought was, I presume, is also to find emerging solutions. And what I've heard is that there is a collaborative way of doing so. It would be wonderful if you could get some examples, real life examples of where collaboration with government, private sector, NGOs have actually worked so that we could learn from that. Great, thank you. Um, second question. Uh, one of the problems that we, we have in Brazil, it's corruption. So most of the, the philanthropists that work, um, try to work in Brazil, they are scared that the money is not arriving there or people when they're doing their donations, they're scared that it's not gonna be where it's supposed to be. So it's hard for us to convince people that the money is getting where they, they're supposed to be. Of course we do uh, uh, posters and we, we 
share with people what we're doing. But one, my question in the end is, what can we do more to try, you know, to, to engage more people around, I don't know, pressuring the government so, so this, this efforts arrive to people? It's something that it's quite hard. And we are talking about, uh, you guys gave the example about agriculture and uh, pesticides and everything. And sometimes we, for ex instance, in Brazil, we got a donation of violence. And it got four times into our, um, I'm really nervous, I'm sorry, <laughs> okay. into our foreign barriers and they got back because the government don't let it in. So okay. it's really hard. Well, was there Did a third question back there or no? Okay, so let's take those first two questions. So um, this question of corruption, who'd like to, to pick up on that? Let's drive. Do take a mic. Yeah. This, this is, while, while the technology is not an absolute panacea, I can give you two good examples of where technology can play a real role in addressing this. Take the example of Nigeria, where the government ge gives subsidies to smallholder farmers. Well, you know, it never got there. And so Nigeria didn't produce. When a new minister of agriculture actually came from Agra and the Rockefeller Foundation went in because he understood the models around technology, and he's now the head of the African Development Bank, he went in and created a mobile wallet so that he could give the smallholder farmers money directly. And guess what? Nigeria is on its way to food self-sufficiency. A simple technological uh, 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 intervention. And it's not a panacea, but there are things you can begin to do. And a lot of donors now are coming to mobile companies like us, asking us to help them create systems where they can make direct disbursements to the poorest people in, people they, in ways they could never have done 10 years ago. Thank you. I do think there's, I mean, this does seem like one of the great opportunities to, I mean, I think the unique ID system in India harnessed to bank accounts, you know, and receiving government payments is going to be massive in terms of the increase in income in practical terms. And there's also, I, mean, I was interested, I mean, there, there was a site in India called I paid a bribe com that I think was very influential as well in raising public awareness. Um, I mean, what, what else, um, in terms of this examples of collaboration that the first questioner was asking for, what are, what are your, any, any really effective examples that you could point to, any of you? Uh, it, the uh, Companies Act that was mentioned earlier um, uh, in India, I think it hasn't yet resulted in large-scale collaboration, but I believe it can actually be one of the most significant events in, uh, in global development because a number of companies, such as the, the Tata Group, they, they're in a position where they can leverage large amounts of money with an amazing network of companies in virtually every sector in, in a country like India. I believe they're starting to do this. Now, with the... With the a, con a conglomerate like that, they're hungry to serve the African market. They're hungry to serve the South Asian, uh, the Southeast Asian, and the rest of the South Asian market. So while these collaborations have not yet happened, this is one significant event. Now, if you, if you go back to the history of poverty alleviation and say what are the big things that have happened, the, only two or three examples come to mind. One is the Green Revolution in Asia, you know, uh, supported heavily by the Ford and the Rockefeller Foundations, and that was a really historic. Uh, set of collaborations between institution building, you know, R&D in, in, in local universities, uh, policy reforms, the right kind of technical input uh, from external actors and so on. And the second one mentioned this morning by Chelsea Clinton was around the availability of affordable ret uh, antiretrovirals for HIV AIDS. There aren't that many successful examples, but we're hoping that this, this uh, event in India will get there. Pro, which is another you know, conglomerate. It has been actively engaging with the government and it's in fact one of the biggest givers among the uh, companies in India. It has been actively engaging with the government on education and it primarily uh, works on education reform as in curriculum reform and teacher training. So they have been very effective. So that's an effective partnership which has been working for quite some time actually. Okay, now unfortunately our time is um, almost up and what I wanted to do was to ask each of you, I mean you have an audience here of of people with tremendous influence and practical 
a practical bent to their, their philanthropy, the desire to be effective philanthropeneurs. I want each of you to say, is there, to maybe challenge the audience, is there one thing that you would like to see them do a lot more of that you think would uh, help advance, um, you know, advance in a philanthropeneurial way uh, the emerging world and tackling some of its biggest problems? I'm going to start with you, Shashi. Being Indian, I'm a firm believer in this notion that ultimately only Indians will solve India's problems, only South Africans will solve South Africa's problems, and so on and so forth. Um, and over the decades, there has been this distrust of the NGO sector and the, and the philanthropy sector. And I worry that the problem that the philanthropy sector is, uh, it's settling for feel-good solutions rather than real-world solutions. and. As so what's your challenge then in that sense? To, to grow beyond that go, and, 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 and give a hard look at, at real solutions rather than feel-good solutions. And there is no easy way to do that, but sometimes that means turning off the tap and grants that aren't working. Ashim. In his canonical book, Theory of Justice, the late great John Rawls, who set the terms and deliberation processes and policies for what we need to do to achieve a just society, says, as part of that, said, this process will take light years. Justice will take a long time to achieve. So it is very important for societies to appear just. Pay attention to the appearances of your acts as you work to achieve justice. Design provides dignity, imagination, and wish images for a future yet to come. Shia? So I'll uh, leave you all with a little story. So Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson are out camping on the British moors, and it's late at night, and they, uh, you know, Sherlock Holmes w wakes up Dr. Watson and says, look up, what do you see? And Dr. Watson, sleepy, tired, looks up and says, well, astronomically speaking, I can see the Little Dipper, Orion's belt, and it's a very clear night. Uh, astrologically speaking, I think Leo is moving into Cancer, so it must be, Cancer's moving into Leo, so it must be the end of July, early August. Um, horologically speaking, I think it's probably about three in the morning. Uh, meteorologically speaking, I see some clouds in the distance, and I think it's probably gonna rain tomorrow. There's a light breeze. And theologically speaking, Sherlock, when I look at this incredible creation all around me, all these stars and the world and how it all works perfectly, I think God must exist. And Sherlock turns to him and says, Watson, you fool, someone's stolen our tent. <laughs> so what I'd like to say is that in this room, we have some great leaders, uh, the star awardees who've been chosen, who are actually working practically in a down-to-earth way, trying to solve the problems of this planet. All of us, the challenge I throw to all of us is to get involved and to work with them to think about how do we scale these solutions. Thank you. Kagi. I'd say please be aware of the shadows um, and try to shine the light on those because um, 40% of funding still goes to the safe zones, education, health, metro cities, and so on. If we really have to have sustainable development, equitable development, then we do have to look at the shadows. They are not safe, they are not comfortable, but they need to be done. Thank you. Strive. You know, being here in Paris at this time, two big events really loom before us. And they represent basically the nexus of where we are. We've got the climate summit, and we had those extraordinary tragic events a couple of weeks ago. Really, I would say we have to step up on leadership. That is the charge in front of this generation. And we're running out of time. Thank you. Well, this has been quite a panel from John Rawls to Sherlock Holmes and, and uh, quite a range of issues in between. Um, for me, I think the message that's come across most clearly has been that collaboration is, is, is crucial to achieving scale. And I think, you know, when you think about risk, which is the theme of philanthropy, one of the biggest risks is often to step outside of 
our silos and you know, throw in our lot with people that we don't know that well and we've got to build trust and all those sorts of things. And so maybe that message is, is the strongest one. That needs, we need to see philanthropeneurs taking the risk of collaborating with others and uh, if we're going to achieve the kind of needle-moving scale change that, that is necessary. But I'd like to thank all our panellists for such an important and stimulating discussion.